Hi guys, let's discuss current affairs in today's first question. And this pertains to the week uh, 3rd to 9th April. So you would have some questions like the first one, which is slightly out of date. Uh, former Chief Justice Gulzar Ahmed was recently nominated caretaker of Prime Minister of, uh, well, the answer is mentioned as Pakistan. Well, that's true, but then uh, you have to understand that Pakistan now has a full-time Prime Minister, Shahbaz Sharif. Uh, so I'll tell you a bit about Pakistan today. Usually we discount this country, we don't look at it uh, in a detailed way. So Pakistan's capital, as you know, is Islamabad. It's a planned city. At the time of partition, there was no place called Islamabad. So Islamabad and um, the president is Arif Alvi. That's a president. The Prime Minister is Shahbaz Sharif and the currency is the Pakistani rupee. Pakistani rupee. Shahbaz Sharif is Sharif is the Prime Minister now. <clears throat> what is the size of Pakistan? See India's area is 32.87 lakh square kilometers. Okay, 87 lakh square kilometers. Pakistan is 7.96 lakh square kilometers. Seven point nine six. Now, when I say seven point nine six, this does not include the areas occupied by it and included in its territory. Because in most journals, wherever I mean you look up Wikipedia, you look up any other source, you would find Pakistan's area quite to be quite different. To this number, they would add the area they have occupied illegally, that is um, 85,000 you know, square kilometers. So Pakistan has added, to be exact, the area it has occupied in Kashmir, the, 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 this area here, you know, the area it is occupied in Pakistan, occupied Ladakh and, uh, sorry, Ladakh and JNK is quite, you know, quite huge actually. So how much has Pakistan occupied? 85,817 square kilometers. That is the area Pakistan has occupied in Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir. In the two union territories of Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir. Okay. Now please understand. The 7.96 does not include that. That because that's our territory. That is India's territory. So we wouldn't include that. But Pakistani government you know, shows its area to be 8.83 lakhs per kilometer, which we are and we are just sticking to the actual area. But you have to understand that at the time of partition, Pakistan included today's Bangladesh and it was in those days called East Pakistan. So to 7.96 lakh, you have to add the area of Bangladesh to get the actual area of Pakistan at the time of independence, at the time of partition. Okay, but this number as you can see here is the area under occupation of Pakistan. This is the total area under occupation of Pakistan. Okay, um, see many people look at um, Urdu to be the main language of Pakistan. It is not my friends. While Urdu is the official language of Pakistan, the main, the white, most widely spoken language is Punjabi. Yes. Punjabi is spoken by about 39% of Pakistani population. 39% of Pakistani population. How? Oh, what's Pakistan's population? Now, this is a number that most of us would not have thought about. Actually, we wouldn't really bother too much about Pakistan's population numbers. Yeah, Pakistan's population is a little over 22 crore, of which 39% speak Punjabi. Yeah, Punjabi. So when I say 22 crore, it is about 22.7 crore, but I'll just make, okay, let's make it 23 crore. But <laughs> uh, Pakistan has one of the highest birth rates in the world. And um, considering that, um, you know, um, they today are about 22.7. A few years back, they were the sixth most populous country. Today, they are the fifth most populous country in the world. And why would that be? You know, um, because they overtake, they overtook Brazil recently. Brazil was the fifth most populous country. Now, Pakistan is the fifth most populous country. 
So the top five most populous nations in the world would be China, about 145 crores, India, uh, see when I say Pakistan, China is 145 crores, there is a significant undercounting in China, okay? Um, there are reasons for that, uh, we will, you know, we'll discuss that later. So China, 145 crore, India about 135 crore, uh, we have uh, number three in the third place is United States, which is like 31.5 crore and United States birth rate is falling drastically, you yeah. Um, you have in the fourth place um, Indonesia about 26.5 crore and in the fifth place is Pakistan 22.7 crore. So Punjabi is the most widely spoken language in uh, Pakistan. In fact ethnicity, what is ethnicity? E-T-H-N-I-C-I-T-Y, ethnicity um, relates to ethnic uh, groups. Uh, see. An ethnic group is a group of people who have more or less a common culture, a common language, a common way of life, more or less, I said more or less, not all basically. Not everything, everyone who belongs to the same ethnic group speaks the same language, have the same, has, a, has the same customs and all that, okay? But more or less, they are similar. So ethnicity wise, Punjab is dominant Pakistan, about 45% of Pakistanis are of Punjabi ethnicity, it is true. Punjabi ethnicity. So um, then you have, um, you know, when, when you look at, we looked at the language part, we looked at the territory part, the ethnics, ethnicity part. What's the Pakistani GDP like? Pakistan's uh, GDP is two hundred eighty-six billion dollars. Two eighty-six billion dollars. This is the size of the Pakistani economy. Two eighty-six billion dollars. Compare that with India. Now let's look at some numbers. Hmm? Um, India's area is 32 lakhs 87,000. Yeah, square uh, 32.87 lakh square kilometers. Pakistan 7.96 lakh square kilometers. Our population is 135 crore against their 22.7 crore. Um, there, we haven't occupied any anyone's territory till date, but Pakistan has occupied about 80, 85,817 square kilometer of Indian territory. And um, this happened in 1947-48, okay? Um, and after that, of course, you look at the GDP numbers, Pakistan's GDP is about $286 billion, ours is about 3000 billion dollars. Hmm? A little about 2980 make it 3000 billion dollars so pakistan's economy is less than one tenth of india's economy okay so that's a little about pakistan i just wanted to share i normally haven't in fact i have never shared this information earlier so you have this stuff here hmm? that is um, you can see this is a map of southeast asia and um, maybe in a little later, I'll tell you more about, um, if not in this class, I'll tell you about this line you see here, this line here, this is the line of control, and what exactly is a line of control, maybe we could in the next class discuss, fair? So from now, uh, from here Pakistan, let's go to Malaysia, which is um, run from two cities, uh, one is Putra Jaya. Putra Jaya is one capital. The second one is Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur. So Pakistan, uh, sorry, Malaysia has two capital cities, Putra Jaya, which is also called the E capital of Pak uh, Malaysia, E capital or electronic capital. It's a Wi-Fi city, the world's first Wi-Fi capital city, Putra Jaya, Kuala Lumpur. Um, the main capital. Then you have the Prime Minister there, Yakub. Yeah, Ismail Sabri. But you write this enough here. Yeah. And the currency is Ringgit. Currency is Ringgit. So the currency is Ringgit. Let's look at Maldives now. Where's Maldives? Uh, while we can't find Malaysia in this map, we certainly can go. Uh, slightly down here, you'll find Maldives. It is the smallest country in Asia. 
okay it's about 298 square kilometers that would make it the smallest country in asia i think both by area and um, if you yeah by population um you look at maldives maldives capital is mali okay i'll write here my friends so we'll go follow the same pattern mali the president is ibrahim mohammed sole ibrahim mohammed sole then the currency is rufia currency is rufia Maldives is the lowest country in the world in terms of altitude above sea level that is it has you know the lowest highest point in the world its highest point is about 5 meters and um, the average height uh, average high altitude average height above sea level is about 1.5 meters so you know a slight rise in the sea levels worldwide could inundate submerge Maldives Okay, so that's Maldives for you guys. From there, we could go to Singapore, which which is at the tip of the Malaysian Peninsula and is a city state. Uh, Singapore, guys, is um, run from Singapore City. You know, it's a tiny place, about seven fifty eight square kilometers, which is like what about twenty five percent of which is which was earlier sea but has been reclaimed and uh, turned into land. Okay, so. capital is singapore city the prime minister is lee shian lung lee shian lung lee shian lung and uh, the currency is singapore dollar singapore dollar indonesia indonesia's capital is jakarta they are planning to shift the capital but that's a work in progress jakarta is a capital in fact this also comes from the sanskrit name okay jakarta then the president is joko widodo the president is joko widodo and the currency is rupia Indonesian rupiah. Hmm? That's rupiah. You could also find the spelling to be this way. Both are fine. Don't worry. <laughs> Fair. Quite exhaustive. If you wish to write more, a little more about um, what we say, uh, Indonesia, you could say world's largest archipelago. World's largest archipelago. world's largest archipelago which would be like um, which would um, which would comprise more than 17000 islands archipelago is a group of islands and indonesia has more than 17000 islands okay guys so that was exhaustive so we mentioned that the prime minister of pakistan is shahbaz sharif who threw out uh, imran khan indian pharma company which indian pharma company has been selected to receive the mrna technology from the who technology transfer hub okay biological evans we could uh, see the e stands for evans but it's generally written as biological e okay um what is mrna you could write this messenger it's a bit complicated i read extensively about this but it's quite complicated for folks like us um, you know who are preparing for ex competitive exams so you simply need to know the full form messenger ribo nucleic acid ribo nucleic acid that's mr m r n a mm C. You shall you write the name? C. Um, Doctor Reddy's Bharat Biotech Biological Evans. Three of three of these are in Hyderabad, my city. Hmm. Doctor Reddy's is run. The C of Doctor Reddy's is Iraz. Iraz, Israeli. Iraz, Israeli. 
सिप्ला उमंग वोहरा सी इनफैक्ट यू नो द नेम कम्स फ्रॉम केमिकल इंडस्ट्रियल फार्मास्यूटिक एंड फार्मास्यूटिकल लेबोरेटरी केमिकल इंडस्ट्रियल फार्मास्यूटिकल लेबोरेटरीज भारत बायोटेक कृष्णा एल्ला बायोलॉजिकल इवेंट्स महिमा दातला बायोकॉन किरण मजूमदार शाह किरण मजूमदार शाह एस एच ए डब्ल्यू किरण मजूमदार शाह एस एच ए ओके डब्ल्यू एच ओ हेडक्वार्टर्ड इन जेनेवा स्विट्जरलैंड रन बाय इट्स डायरेक्टर जनरल इज डॉक्टर टेड्रोस एडानम whom the following persons has recently been appointed india's next foreign secretary vinay mohan quatra who is succeeding harsh shringla harsh shringla the outgoing foreign secretary of india hmm rajiv gauba he is the cabinet secretary of india see this is the highest post in india for an is officer cabinet secretary this is the pinnacle of an ias officer's career girish chandra murj murmu is the controller and auditor general auditor general cag suresh patel chief vigilance commissioner chief vigilance commissioner Bharat Lal, he is my namesake. I am Bharat. That guy is Bharat Lal, but of course, apart from that, there is no other similarity. So, Bharat Lal is a mission director, mission director of Jal Jeevan Mission, Jal Jeevan Mission, Jal Jeevan Mission. Hmm. Which country's opposition party has rejected an invitation from its president to form a unity government, urging is the president's resignation over the country's worsening shortages of food, fuel, and medicines? Well, Sri Lanka, we all know that. In fact, there are two questions related to this. The next one: the governor of Sri Lanka's central bank, Ajit Niwad, submitted his resignation. He is also gone. So before that, let me tell you about Sri Lanka. Where is Sri Lanka? Just look up this map. You will find. This is Sri Lanka. Hmm? It's a tiny country, very tiny country. You can see this. How small is it? Hmm. Just let me take you again back to this particular. Sri Lanka is about sixty-five thousand six hundred square kilometers. I don't want you to remember this, but I want you to know that it's easy to remember. Yeah. Sixty-five thousand six hundred square kilometers. Um. the round figure of goods yeah uh, population about 2.2 crore 2.2 crore it's actually triple 2 crores but it's over okay. 2.2 crores uh this is a country that gained independence in 1948 1948 from the british uh, it was a part of the british empire you know what Uh, just before that before i tell you what the crisis is about you know i'll tell you a bit about its leadership the the entire country is run by four brothers all belong to the same family okay when i say four brothers the all belonging is brothers need not belong to the same family when you call your friend hey bro doesn't mean the person is your family no so i'm talking the two brothers hmm? the rajapaksa brothers rajapaksa brothers 
So I will focus on three brothers. One is Gotabaya President, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa. He is seen as the number one devil in the country. Then Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. Then Finance Minister Basil. Basil Rajapaksa. Basil Rajapaksa. Okay. So what's happened in Sri Lanka? Why are things so bad in Sri Lanka? So let me tell you a short story. Hmm? Sri, Sri Lanka's population is small, economic opportunities are limited, and that has meant that a lot of people have left the have left the country, you know, left the country to work abroad. If you look at the industry, you know, the, the, the state of Kerala, you know, a lot of these, you know, um, Indians who work in Gulf nations, in the Persian Gulf nations, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, come from Kerala. Now, why? Because there are no, almost no economic opportunities. Um, of course, communist um, governments always talk about employment and industrial development and all, agriculture development, there hardly any, you know, there is hardly any development. Uh, so Sri Lanka, you know, um, mainly subsist. What? How does Sri Lanka get its revenue? The main sources of revenue. Okay, if you have written this, I'll clear this now. Okay, uh, the main source of revenue in Sri Lanka are tourism. It's a country with green beaches, very green, lush green beaches. The tropical forest in the center of the country. And especially if you look at the east and western part of the country, they have great beaches. So tourism is one major source. The other is remittance. Now what, what is remittance? Remittance is the money sent by nationals working abroad. Money sent home by national nationals, means citizens working abroad. So when your uncle sends money home from the place he works abroad, you know, for a very works abroad. Let's say your uncle works in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. The guy sends money home. That money is called remittance. Sri Lanka has always been a remittance economy. So number three, um, agriculture, mainly rice, a little of rice and tea. These are two major exports. Fair. So what exactly happened? In this? See the COVID pandemic destroyed the country. You know, if you look at the major sources of income, tourism, lockdown, pandemic meant that people would not, you know, people didn't travel to Sri Lanka, didn't visit Sri Lanka. So when people don't visit, they don't bring in money, isn't it? If no money comes to the country, no foreign exchange comes to the country. Remittance, the people are working, not working abroad because pandemic shut down, even the shut down everything. At the same time, um, people who were stuck in Sri Lanka while they were working abroad could not have contributed anything. So the remittance money that was coming in from abroad didn't come in. Yeah. At the same time, okay, let me bring in one and two together now. So the money didn't come in. Substantial proportion of Sri Lanka's foreign action reserves went down. There was no money. Okay, there was no money. Now, the government, in its ample wisdom, banned fertilizers. Can you believe that? The government said, no, 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 we will not have chemicals, no, we will not have pesticides, we will not use any, you know, chemical stuff in our fields. So they banned use of chemicals. They say, go organic. You know, this was overnight. It's not gradual. It was not gradual. So you could have a timeline, okay, in five years, we'll slowly move to organic stuff. No, they said. Sudden change meant that farmers did not, could not produce, could not produce. So many people did not know how to use organic stuff, how to cultivate the bees. In the beginning, it's always true. In the beginning, organic yield is always less, okay? Uh, the farm yield through organic means is always low, which meant that Sri Lanka's rice production went down. 
rice production went down tea production went down these two they were exporting and they were uh, earning revenue through this earning foreign exchange through this now sri lanka could not export tea there was not much to export yeah because of the pandemic countries had locked down so goods would not move in so sri lankan tea exports went down tea production went down at the same time rice production went down in fact sri lanka while it was an exporter in the past uh, in the pandemic uh, you know it became a net importer why because the government banned uh, fertilizers chemicals and you know, other chemi- and other stuff which meant the production fell and the production fell rice from being a net exporter they actually imported rice worth 450 million dollars you bet man they imported rice worth 450 million dollars okay in the recent past t they earlier used to earn their earnings last you know before the pandemic were this much from t exports 435 million dollars so the money didn't come in imagine that first the t revenue didn't come in the rice revenue did not come in through exports their exports now on the other side they had to import rice so they paid so much now remittances didn't come in tourism revenue didn't come in tea exports revenues no nothing so revenues went down foreign exchange went down when foreign exchange isn't there could they have been able to pay for their imports they were importing oil gas and all chemicals they were importing um, you know engineering goods they were importing other you know uh, what say uh, important stuff but now there was no money to pay for them you got it there was no money to pay for them so that created see when you are supplier to sri lanka and the guys don't pay you will you keep supply you won't yeah so the supply stopped you know uh, when the supply stopped you know the the scarcity you know there was scarcity in the market and the scarcity led to a rise in prices okay now there was another bad step the government took fourth one cutting taxes reducing taxes tax cuts tax cuts when the government cut taxes the central government's revenue went down so it did not have enough money to spend so welfare measures went down yeah now obviously when people lack money you borrow so the government of sri lanka borrowed a lot of money from abroad but then it already owed a lot there was already a lot of foreign debt of sri lanka now how what is your sri lankan gdp let me bring in gdp now sri lanka's gdp is 84 billion dollars current gdp of sri lanka is 84 billion dollars 84 billion dollars you know is a total value of all goods and services produced in sri lanka yes but then it had borrowed money over the years it had to repay that money uh, money came from india money came from sri lanka from the international monetary fund from uh, asian development bank from japan which was one of the biggest lenders to sri lanka so now we did not have money at the same time it kept borrowing so today the foreign debt of sri lanka listen to this the sri lanka the foreign debt of sri lanka is about um, 110% of its gdp the foreign debt external debt of sri lanka is 110% of its gdp okay india's case it's about 20% 20% of our gdp is what we owe to the world i mean 20% of that got it our external debt is 614 billion dollars 615 take 615 615 billion dollars is different okay from you know um is different from pakistan china uh, sorry uh, sri lanka's foreign debt, foreign debt why the sri lanka's gdp is very small their debt is about um, 95 billion dollars where is the paisa there is no paisa so they are still looking at borrowing they have asked india they have asked china we said that we will not give you paisa but we will open credit lines india has recently given a credit line of 1 billion dollars and before that there was 2.2 and a billion dollars so overall in the last 
12 months, we have given about three and a half billion dollar worth of credit line, which means that Sri Lanka will not get money from us, but yes, they can borrow our goods and services on credit. So if they want to buy rice from India, they could buy, could pay later. It's called credit line. Aaj, you borrow, you know, you can buy today, pay later. You know, all these schemes, shopping schemes. Buy today, pay later. Same thing. So, in the aftermath of this, there was immense scarcity in the country of essential goods because there was no money to pay for imports and the imports would not sell their goods to Sri Lanka. Rice production went down. Oil and gas was not there. So, Sri Lanka today is under massive strain. There are riots. They are... They are they, see, one... There, there is curfew in the country. There is a sense of national emergency, but they removed, the, they lifted national emergency three days back. Okay. Um, there is a great deal of anger, resentment, frustration. There are scores of protests against the Sri Lankan government to, 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 to do something that will reduce the hardship faced by people. No, it didn't help. In the midst of all these problems, yeah, Sri Lankan government said, okay, tax revenue, our tax revenue has gone down. We will do one thing, let's print currency. So they printed currency. Can you believe that? They printed currency and when the print currency printed, the government spent money. Money came into the hands of people. When money came into the hands of people, what happened? People had purchasing power. But pe while people had purchasing power, there was, there was an excess of supply of money in the market. There were no goods to buy with that money. So what happened? Prices went up. Again, when prices went up, the purchasing value of money went down. So Sri Lanka is facing problems of its own making, the government's own making. Okay. So tax cuts, you could also add, you know, uh, what to say, uh, printing currency. Printing currency. So, I mean, serious issues, uh, absolute serious issues. So this got up by the Rajapaksa family is said to be close to China. You know, recently the finance minister of um, Sri Lanka was in India, Basil was in India, and um, the prime, the president of the country, Gotabaya, had spoken to the prime minister, uh, our prime minister Narendra Modi, for assistance. So I am not even talking about those ports, unnecessary infrastructure, everything. So this is how it is, my friends. Yeah. So these are the reasons why the Sri Lankan government, you know, is facing, why the people of Sri Lanka are facing extreme hardship in the country. Okay? So I'll just tell you about one country, Bhutan. Bhutan's capital is Timpu. And its president is, not president, its king is, okay, let's not write the king's name. His name is Kesar Nangyal Wangchuk. Okay, so I'll give the name of the prime minister. Lote Sharing. Lote Sharing. Hmm. So, I don't know if the currency is Gultrum. Fair, I think we discussed this. So I'll just give the names of the capitals. Naipi Daw, Kathmandu. This you know, so I'll write in Singapore. I think we discussed the rest. Find the correct matches about the 64th Grammy Awards. All of them are right. And this is Falguni Shah. Falguni Shah is Falu. Yes. Falguni Shah trained, she was born in Mumbai. She trained as a classical vocalist and a sarangi expert. Under Sultan, you know, under uh, Ustad Sultan Khan. Yes. Under uh, Ustad Sultan Khan. So these are the all true things. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to discuss this now because um, um, it doesn't make sense for us to discuss things that most of you won't relate. I listen to a lot of this music. If you're ever free, listen to this guy. You like English music, Johnny Cash. 
great voice neil young old world voices hmm? listen to them fair okay i could do one thing i could actually i could give you the names of the two guys who make silk sonic silk sonic you could write this bruno mars so there it's a two member band one is bruno mars okay right is bruno mars andrew park andrew park andrew park okay yeah The 15th Finance Commission recently recommended a total of 2.36 lakh crore for rural local bodies in 28 states for the period of okay, ending 2026, five-year period ending 2026. Who was the chairman of the 15th Finance Commission? N K Singh or Nand Kishore Singh, IAS officer. So you just write this. This particular part you write. Finance Commission. That is important. Okay. Finance Commission. Underline that. First point. Set up under Article Two Fifty, sorry Two Eighty. Yeah. Article Two Eighty of the Constitution of India. Of the Constitution of India. Of the Constitution of India. Next. Appointed by President. Appointed by President. For a term of five years, or once every five years, once every five years, next main functions are main functions are are defining financial relations between the center and the states between the center and the states. between the center and the states and 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 mm in the center and the states and what is that um recommend recommend methods of revenue generation newer methods methods of revenue generation So we'll not go there. The choices: YVD, X, Governor of RBI, current Governor of RBI, Shakti Kanta Das. Okay. If you want to write that, 15th Finance Commission Chairperson, um, what's the name? 15th Finance Commission Chairperson is um, Nand Nand Kishore Singh, N K Singh. It's there in the question. Nand Kishore Singh. Nand Kishore Singh. So, Nand Kishore Singh. Next, find the correct statement about the merger of HDFC Bank with HDFC. I think all of them are correct. They recently announced um, the merger between um, um, the parent HDFC and uh, the retail their retail arm HDFC Bank. So today, HDFC Bank is India's largest private sector bank and. It's the third, um, you know, third biggest company by market capitalization. Third biggest by market capitalization. Okay, so if you look at um, choices here, I'll read a few of this. Um, HDFC, the parent company, will acquire forty-one percent stake in HDFC Bank, and um, obviously, when two firms merge, the shareholders of one firm, you know, um, will receive. Some shares of the other firm as well. Okay, HDFC Bank's ch chairperson is uh, Deepak Parekh, but I want you to write um, that uh, HDFC's um, MD is Renu Sud Karnad. Renu Sud Karnad. MD is this. And this chairperson of 
HDFC Bank Chairperson is Atanu Chakrabartu. Atan, so sorry guys. Atanu Chakrabarti or Chakrabarti. Chakrabarti. Atanu Chakrabarti. So, the bank with the highest market capitalization. Its market cap, you know, a, a, you know, today is, uh, you know, 13th uh, of April and um, its market cap as of today is 8.91 lakh crore rupees. As you know, market capitalization is the number of outstanding shares multiplied by the share price and that is what it is. All the shares of HDFC Bank multiplied by the share price of each share, you get that number, 8.91 lakh crore rupees. Fair. So, whom of the following billionaires bought a 9.2% stake in Twitter to become a shareholder? To become a shareholder, it's top shareholders. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Elon Musk, my friends, is the CEO of um, Tesla. He is a terror. <laughs> He's the richest person in the world today. He's the CEO of Tesla, SpaceX. SpaceX, SpaceX is Space Exploration Corporation Limited. Okay, that's Elon Musk. And this guy holds a double BA, one in economics, the other in physical physics. He is from South Africa, but um, he's an American citizen now. He's rated the richest person in the world, ranked the richest person in the world too, with a wealth of $273 billion. Okay. And you should know that um, Elon Musk also owns other companies. He co-founded other companies like, um, you know, Neuralink. He's a co-founder of Neuralink, brain sciences company. Then um, a company called, uh, what is this, Tesla, the Boring Company, which bo bores holes and uh, is looking at revolutionizing transport by having tunnels below the earth I mean below the earth means below the surface the boring company hmm so he is a you know co-founder of PayPal yeah, plenty of stuff Twitter is a social media company and uh, Twitter's head office is in San Francisco San Francisco United States and its CEO is Parag Agarwal. Parag Agarwal. Hmm. Jeff Bezos is a founder chairperson of Amazon.com, the world's largest internet company. It's the world's largest internet company. Mukesh Ambani is the chairperson of Reliance Industries Limited, Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft, Warren Buffett, chairperson of a company called Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway is a holding company which owns companies like NetJets. It owns uh, Fruit of the Loom. It's a innerwear company. Yeah, it owns. Um, you know this Geico G E I C O. It's an insurance company, so it owns a lot of companies. Okay. Viktor Orban has recently been re-elected prime minister of um, Hungary. This is Hungary. Yeah, he is a complete right winger, and this guy says um, when you know European Union sanctioned um, quotas. It sanctioned quotas for refugees from Iraq, Afghanistan. Syria when they were you know flooding into Europe so European Union said each country each member country will have to take as you know X number of refugees Orban said I will not take any refugees my country is not a shelter for refugees yeah they, he, he was quite he was quite uh, you know emphatic in this and he said that I don't want your money you can keep the money you can keep your you know 
you can quote the refugees I don't want any refugees from there so I'll just tell you the capitals of these places Hungary Budapest if you want the capital okay the leader Victor Orban and the currency is foreign currency is foreign Belarus this is Belarus Romania yeah this is Romania Belarus Moldova this is a tiny country of Moldova here this is Moldova this was once a part of the Soviet Union hmm. Ukraine, Belarus, all these were part of Soviet Union. This, okay. So anyway, um, Belarus, Minsk is the capital, and the, well, Minsk is the capital. The um, president is Alexander. In some places, you will find this spelling. Alexander, okay, uh, Alexander Lukashenko. Alexander Lukashenko. Alexander Lukashenko, and the currency is ruble, Belarusian ruble. You can write R O U B L E. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, yeah. So you could write that. Um, and we have Romania. Romania's capital is, you can see the map, Bucharest. The president is Klaus Iohannis. Klaus Iohannis, and the currency is Lu. And this loop okay so currency is loop then Poland this is Poland a county Russia country so sorry guys uh, I think I need to move it to the pen yeah I put it as laser Poland's capital is Warsaw. The president is Andres Duda. Poland's currency is Zloty. Zloty. Hmm? So, Zloty. Moldova, you see what's what's the capital? Chisinau, I guess. Chisinau is the capital, and um, boy, bit. You see this? This is Chisinau. Natalia, the president is Natalia Gavrilita. Gavrilita hmm? and the currency is Moldovian loop Moldovian loop okay yeah Moldovian loop so that should be fine I guess Again, Eastern Europe. Serbian President Alexander Vucic. You can say Vucic also. Recently won a term, new term by the landslide, which is a massive landslide is anything massive. Okay. Um, the capital of Serbia is Belgrade. Capital of Serbia is Belgrade. Yes, yes. This is Serbia. See this entire region. Let me drag lines here.
this was a country called Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia existed between 1918 to 1920, 1992. 1992. In 92, it broke up and its republics became its its states became independent countries. Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, um, Macedonia, uh, Kosovo, yeah, Slovenia, all these places. Okay. So, Sofia is the capital of Bulgaria. We'll stick to only capitals now in this case. Bulgaria, Bucharest, Romania, we mentioned this. So, I think this is not required. Budapest, Hungary a while ago. Riga, Latvia. You want to know where is Latvia? It's up in the Baltic. This is Latvia. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. This is Russia. You see this here? Russia, Russia. Which country, the world's largest opium producer, announced a ban on the cultivation of narcotics? Afghanistan. See, this is all hogwash. I mean, this is only on paper. The biggest source of revenue for Afghanistan's government, that is the Taliban, is narcotics. Sale of poppy, mainly poppy. Hmm? Sale of poppy. <laughs> See, it is very easy to know all these things. This is hypocrisy. This is absolute hypocrisy, nothing else. So 91% of, it is believed that 95, 91% of world's opium comes from Afghanistan. The numbers vary depending on the season, but in a good season, it's about 90% of the world's opium comes from Afghanistan. Opium comes from uh, a plant called poppy, poppy plant. Hmm? So, shall we write about Afghanistan? Okay, Afghanistan. Afghanistan's capital is Kabul, as you know. It's also the name of the river on which it is built. Then we have, see, Afghanistan has an interim government, interim government. So we will stick to one something very simple. Stick to something very simple. The simple thing is the leader of the Taliban because they have an interim prime minister, they have an interim president. So why not stick to something very simple, uh, something like, you know, something like um, we have um, the leader of the Taliban, Hibatullah Akunjada, write his name. Hibatullah Akunjada. Message. Akun Sada. Hibatullah Akun Sada. Okay. So, uh, when you talk about Hibatullah um, Akun Sada, know that the Taliban was founded by Mullah Omar, mainly by Mullah Omar. Of course, there was Mullah Baradar, Abdul Baradar also. But then, you know, Mullah Omar is generally said to be the brains behind this. Okay? Brains behind this. So, you have... Uh, normally, we have rarely discussed Syria, no? Why not we discuss this? Damascus is the capital. From this comes from the silk damask damask is a kind of silk okay the word damascus is the name of the country's capital syria you know country of syria's capital and its president is a dictator named bashar al-assad he belongs to the assad dynasty assad dynasty okay so we have um, The currency is Syrian pound, P O U N D, pound. Enough. By the way, after Afghanistan, the second biggest producer of opium is uh, Myanmar. Myanmar, M Y A N M A R, India's eastern neighbor. Hmm? Identify the Indian who was recently appointed a member of the high level expert group on net zero emissions commitments of non state entities constituted by the UN Secretary General to bolster action against global warming. Arunabha Ghosh, 
this guy you could write is the CEO of a think tank named Council on Energy Environment and Water. So that's it, C E E W. Council on Energy, Environment and what is that? Water. He is the CEO of that this uh, think tank. Vandana Shiva launched in the Navadhanya movement. Navadhanya movement. Sunanda, Sunita Narayan is a head of this think tank NGO named Center for Science and Environment. Center for Science and Environment. These choices, huh? Tulsi Gowda. Oh, this is uh, the lady from Karnataka who's, you know, who's planted over one lakh trees, uh, and she's nicknamed the Encyclopedia of the Forest. Encyclopedia of the Forest. She can identify any plant, any leaf, any flower. Talk about its uses, its parent, you know, parent tree, everything. Yeah, some people are gifted. Maybe they, she just worked hard. Hmm? Chandi Pasad Bhatt. Um, you know, Chipko movement, where people would hug trees to to to, to discourage, uh, you know, um, fellers, tree fellers, tree fellers mean tree cutters. So he started something called the Dasholi Gram Swaraj Yojana. Gram Swaraj Sangh. Swaraj Sangh. Dasholi Gram Swaraj Sangh. Okay. Dasholi Gram Swaraj Sangh. This is a progenitor. I mean, this is the movement on this is the organization which led which started the Chipko movement. Okay. To strengthen, and by the way, Chandi Prasad Bhatt has all has all uh, had also won has also won the Gandhi Peace Prize. Gandhi Peace Prize, I think 2013 or 15. Identify to sorry to strengthen dope testing in India. Sports Minister Anurag Singh Thakur has launched six new and rare reference materials developed by the National Dope Testing Laboratory, which is in New Delhi. Okay, and before you go anywhere, I just want to tell you that he is also the Information and Broadcasting Minister. Information and Broadcasting Minister. You should know that he is the Sports and Youth Affairs Minister. This is the full name of the ministry. Sports and Youth Affairs Minister Anurag Singh Thakur also happens to be the Minister of Information and Broadcasting. Now, as far as the choices are concerned, Ahmedabad is home to Physical Research Laboratory, PRL, Physical Research laboratory physical research laboratory new delhi well plenty of formations this one national dope testing lab nagpur you could write um central sorry national research center national research center for citrus for citrus national research center for citrus hmm. Katak National R Rice Research Institute National Rice Research Institute Earlier it was called Central Rice Research Institute Now it's called National Rice Research Institute Prayagraj in Uttar Pradesh you're right. Central organization, 
सेंट्रल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन फॉर रेलवे सेंट्रल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन फॉर रेलवे इलेक्ट्रिफिकेशन इलेक्ट्रिफिकेशन Which of the following nations won the ICC Women's World Cup for the seventh time? Australia. Why didn't you write this? Here, yeah. 2022 host New Zealand. Host New Zealand. Winner Australia. Seventh title. Yeah, it's already mentioned. Seventh title. Runner-up. England. See the two other semi-finalists were. You could, if you want, to write semi-finalists. Of course, Australia and England would be there, but two others were West Indies and South Africa. West Indies and Republic of South Africa. West Indies and RSA. Hmm. India has won it twice, but this time India could not go past the group stage. Okay, you write last point. Player of the series. Player of the series. Player of the series. Alisa Healy of Australia. Alisa Healy of Australia. Hmm. Shall. By the way, do you know the first women's cricket World Cup was held in 1973. The first women's cricket World Cup was held in 1973, a full two years before the men's cricket World Cup was held. ODI cricket World Cup was held. The first men's cricket World Cup, ODI World Cup, World Cup now is Test Championship also, so we have to distinguish. Um, the first men's ODI World Cup was held in. 1975, but the women's World Cup took took place two years before the men's World Cup. Yeah. Who of the following became the first woman to ever to officiate as a match referee in the World Cup cricket final in New Zealand? Lakshmi. Yeah, G S Lakshmi. It's, I think we'll skip this part. Hmm? Name the Indian shuttler who had to settle for a silver medal after losing to Toma Popov. In the men's singles fight, all the information is already given. So there is nothing for me to discuss. Yeah, um, just one thing. You could write this: Lakshya Sen, runner-up at All England Badminton Championship. All England Badminton Championship. Who was the winner? Winner was Victor Axelson. Of Denmark. Okay. Which country will promote the implementation of stalled 1800 km Tapi gas pipeline that will pass through Afghanistan, Pakistan and culminate in India? So Tapi, you could write just simple points. Tapi, full form, Turkmenistan, it's mentioned here. So Turkmenistan, A for Afghanistan, P for Pakistan, I for India, I for India. This is the first time Someone talked of this pipeline was in 1995, but till now it has not happened. It's not. It's. It's not uh, become operational. See, Turkmenistan has a lot of gas, and very few countries buy gas. See, Iran would not buy gas because Iran has gas. Russia would not buy gas because it has a lot of gas. Yeah. So Afghanistan is a basket case, very small economy. Pakistan needs gas, 
India needs gas. So we said that, okay, Turkmenistan will buy gas from you. So they were happy, more than happy to sell. So they, these four countries, um, you know, in the 2010s, a few years back, they kind of, you know, set up this joint venture, if you may call it, yeah, um, to transport gas from the gas surplus to Turkmenistan, to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Afghanistan demanded a transit fee. Yes, even when the Taliban back in those days was in power, the you know, companies, um, the governments, uh, the government officials of Turkmenistan, foreign companies that are involved in the entire contract, laying of the pipeline and all these things, they negotiate with Taliban. See, when it comes to money, everything is the same. I mean, everything is secular. Money is the greatest bringer of people together. <laughs> you may wonder why I have said this. See, rivals like Taliban and American companies sat down together to discuss this deal. Do you know that? Yeah. This is my favorite subject. Discussing, you know, the happenings behind the deals. But then, um, I'll not go there. Uh, we need only the upar ka gyan, I mean, the, the, the surface, the superficial stuff for our exams. So, this is a 18-14 kilometer, you know, pipeline that would transport the gas from Turkmenistan to New Delhi via Afghanistan and Pakistan. These two countries want transit fee, paisa, because they are giving their sovereign territory for transporting, stuff, you know, gas. Pakistan also has um, talked about buying gas from Turkmenistan through this pipeline. In India, the pipeline will end in the Punjab town of Fazilka. Fazilka. Okay. Chala. See, India is the third largest energy consumer in the world. We are talking of electricity, gas, petroleum, everything. We are the third largest energy consumer in the world. Number one, United States. Number two, China. Number three, India. So we need a lot of stuff. Wherever we could buy from, we'll buy. Mm. Taiwan's capital. I'll just give the names of the capitals. Um, Taiwan's capital is Taipei. Tajikistan. This is Tajikistan. Okay. Dushanbe. That I think that's a capital. Yeah. Turkey. Ankara. Turkmenistan. Ashgabat. Okay. Ashgabat. See, when we are talking of these kinds of countries, please know that the situation in this region is quite volatile, very volatile, okay. What if tomorrow in a war situation, Pakistan, you know, turns up the tap or, you know, the militants in Pakistan set fire to the pipeline. So there could be a disruption in supply. And that's why we always have a very wide basket of suppliers, yeah. Thailand's capital, as you know, is Bangkok. Yeah. Why is there a lot of emphasis on branchless banking in India? All of them, you can see that actually. Yeah, all of them. Success of ATMs, what is ATM? Automated teller machine. See, back in the day, you know, before ATMs came in, became, you know, ubiquitous, that is everywhere. Teller was a, an official in the bank. Even, even today, when you go to a bank, you'll find a counter called Teller. Back in, you know, before the, 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 the old Jamana, I think, back in those days, Teller was a guy who would give you information, he would tell. That's why Teller. Okay. So nowadays, Tellers performs the functions of a depositor or, you know, uh, what we say, um, uh, cash collector. So you put money across. The person would collect deposit in an account like that or give you money. Yeah, withdraw. You can help you withdraw. So, automated teller machines the first ATM came since its success. We're talking of first K ATM came to India in 1987. Yeah, HSBC Bank. I remember this to be 4th of September 1987. The first ATM in India was installed in Mumbai. Mumbai. So, we don't really require. We don't really require what we say banking now uh, in terms of going to the bank and all that. See, I have not been to the bank in almost what I guess one two years now. 
yeah so a little over that actually and because in fact people like me don't even carry cash except for a 100 or 200 because everything is upi based scanners credit cards debit cards you don't really require all you require is a phone you require a phone and uh, you know things are done yes Banks usually sell their bad loans to asset reconstruction companies. So these asset reconstruction companies, ARCs, they buy bad loans from banks at a discount. Let's say they buy at 55 rupees. Okay. The loan is 100 rupees. ARC says, okay, we will buy it for 55 rupees. The bank would sell because bank says, you know, we have failed to get back this money from the depositor, from the borrower and it would take ample resources from our side to get back that money. So we will sell it to ARC because the ARC says we will try to recover that money. So the bank is taking a share, you know, is taking a cut of 45 rupees, loss of 45 rupees. So ARC buys it for 55 rupees, um, then tries to get it from the borrower. So if it makes, let's say 75 rupees, it makes profit. But if it does, it's make, it makes only 50 rupees, 45 rupees, then it makes a loss. It makes a loss. So if an ARC collects less you know, money that is less than its purchase price, it suffers a loss. But if it collects more than the purchase price, it makes a profit. As far as banks are concerned, they are at least getting 55, then complete write-off. Yeah. To recognize a a customer and give access to their bank account which are the following ATMs use verification of fingers fingerprint system instead of PIN personal identification numbers okay biometric you use a thumb or some kind of you know biometric you know method to access your you know funds or other bank account details what's a white label ATM it's a third party ATM not owned by a bank third party ATM not owned by a bank so an AT, a white label ATM is, not, is owned by, if you want to write like this, owned by a non-banking entity, non-banking entity, yes. So let's say you own a company, you don't have a banking company, but you set up ATMs, you know, those ATMs will be called white label ATMs. You can write, you know, you can actually withdraw you know from such accounts for each is but the problem with white label ATMs in India I have found is um, I once once went to a white label ATM owned by one large corporate they have a ceiling of transaction amount that could be withdrawn 2500 rupees which would mean that if I had to withdraw 20,000 rupees I would have to do eight transactions which like is a lot of time it expends a lot of time but it benefits the ATM you know, owner because for every transaction they charge the bank money. You understand that? Yes. They make money but we suffer a serious loss of time and that is not fun. It is never fun. SLR, statutory liquidity ratio. I think we discussed this in the recent past. Maybe in the next class I will bring back all the statutory terms like repo bank rate yeah all that stuff slr crr and all statutory liquidity ratio i will write the liquidity is an easy word to write ratio so is ratio statutory liquidity ratio is that part of bank deposit which a bank has to keep in highly liquid assets which can be you know in the form of gold garment securities and all that cash is the ratio is kept with rbi but when it comes to slr it is you know, the government tells, the RBI tells these banks, current SLR is 18%, means 18% of whatever you collected from the public, that is through deposits, you have to, you know, you have to invest 18% of that money in, um, you know, what we say, in, um, in gold, highly liquid assets like gold, uh, government securities. So these are liquid, highly liquid. In case the, the bank runs, bank has, is suffering, withdrawals the thousands of you know in you know, bank you know banking customers they come and say no no you have to give back our money we don't trust this bank so there are panic withdrawals to avoid that kind of a situation the government says okay um, the bank the rbi says 
you uh, banker all the banks should keep some part of it, your money in these things so in case there is a crisis you can con readily convert these investments into paisa and pay back the depositors so the basic purpose of slr is to avoid a run on the bank avoid a run on the bank these days these things don't happen yeah unless the bank collapses but it's a rare thing okay so I'll discuss SLR again in the next class. So will I bring in repo, bank, all this stuff. Hmm? Which of the following is a process for checking the credit worthiness of an applicant for a loan, etc. Background check, whether the person is trustworthy or not, whether the borrower is trustworthy. Can I give a loan to this guy? You know, they would run a background check, check my credit appraisal, credit score and everything. Have I been making payments on time? How am I manage my finances well? So that is that background check is called credit appraisal. How do you spell etc? Yeah, the spelling is this is two, se two separate words. Et cetera. Et cetera. Two sounds. Sorry, three sounds. Okay, that's the spelling. I know it would be a surprise to some of you. Which of the following institutions recently lowered the limit for ways and means advances for states to 47,000 crore effective from 1st April? It's It was a little over 55,000 crore. It's now brought down to 47,000 crore. Now what exactly is so the answer is RPF of course. You know, uh, what is exactly is ways and means? You could write this. Ways and means. WME. Ways and means advances. Mason means advances. Sorry. Underline that. Right, first point. Banks can banks be and banks can avail A V A I L avail immediate cash, immediate cash or immediate funds. That's better. Immediate funds from the RBI from the RBI from the RBI okay full stop such borrowing or you can take a second step second point such borrowing helps the bank helps the bank sorry helps the bank uh, address the mismatch helps the bank address the mismatch between receipts and payments This is an I am so sorry. I, I, I should not have used the word banks. I am so sorry, friends. I am extremely sorry. I was wondering something was wrong. So, not banks can avail. You could write governments can avail. It is for governments, state governments. Okay. I am so sorry, guys. You can write governments can avail. Government, otherwise, singular. Government can avail. Replace the word bank with government. Okay, it's my mistake. I'm so sorry. But when I say something incorrect, no, something goes in the brain and he says, Yeah, Bharat, you have said something wrong. Yeah, and I was wondering what went wrong. That's why I was looking at something in some of these letters here. So it is not bank, it's government. Okay. Government can avail um, immediate cash or funds from the RBI. Yeah. Full stop. This or such borrowing helps the bank, helps the government address the mismatches between mismatch between receipts and payments. Okay. Next. Payment or repayment or borrowing has to be repaid. Loan has to be repaid. 
has to be repaid at end of 90 days at repo rate interest repo rate interest at repo rate interest repo rate interest so the repo rate is 2% you know they have to pay 2% if it's 4% they have to pay 4% next if next if the wmo borrowing the wma wma borrowing exceeds 90 days exceeds 90 days exceeds 90 days comma it is treated as it is treated as an overdraft an overdraft it is treated as an overdraft comma charged at charged at interest of charged of charged at interest rate of 2% above repo rate 2% above repo rate 2% above repo rate 2% above repo rate You know the full forms now. The first one is Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Next. Third one, SEBI. Securities and Exchange Board of India. Securities and Exchange Board of India. Securities and Exchange Board of India. Fifth one, SIDBI. SIDBI is Small Industries Development Bank of India. Small Industries the Development Bank of India. Small Industries the Development Bank of India. Who are the following Indian women entrepreneurs were featured in the latest Hurun Richest Self Made Women in the World 2022? Kiran Majumdar Shah, who is a chairperson of a Biocon, um, you know, biotechnology and pharmaceutical giant. Falguni Nair, CEO of Naika. Radha Vembu Zoho, is a software services company. So all of them were there. Yeah. So pretty simple question actually. Ah, this comes. This brings us to the end of this discussion and I'm so sorry for that goof up between government and bank and now usually we discuss banks so I think I just went with that flow. Thank you for being here. Have a lot of fun. Stay curious.